emergency and trauma services. Um, she's graciously stepped in at the, at the 12th hour. So I'm the substitute, so be nice to the substitute. <laughs> 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 Actually, the sepsis topic, I just want to reassure you, our next ED seminar actually will be surrounding sepsis. It will be sepsis care across the continuum. Fran and I have been working on a project um, to rapidly identify sepsis, identify infection with interventions, and it'll be, um, it might even be the whole seminar with a lot of different speakers um, from a physician standpoint, from emergent, triage, to acute care, etc. And we're going to be doing a whole study on um, reducing admissions to the ICU, or the PICU, obviously, um, by identifying um, sepsis early on and intervening. So it's going to be an exciting time. So that topic has not gone away, just been postponed. So without further ado, I'm speaking when trauma is not an accident. And this topic is about non-accidental trauma. <laughs> so, the disclosure. No one involved in this planning or presentation has any relevant financial relationships. We have to say this whenever we're talking about trauma or ER. This case is an actual case, but some things have been changed, um, and it definitely has been de-identified. Okay, so today we'll be able to ident identify common risk factors associated with non-accidental trauma. They call it NAT. Um, this is a commonly used acronym, but, and it means child maltreatment. And we're going to recognize red flags, um, indicators that NAT should be considered and ruled out. And hopefully we'll become familiar with special considerations and nursing implications regarding NAT. So I'll be kind of weaving in pathophys, signs and symptoms, pre-hospital, field interventions, ED interventions, and keep working the case study, and then at the end, the nursing implications. Okay, so we have a three-year-old child on um, bathtub near drowning. The caregiver reports leaving the patient unattended for a few minutes, returning to find the patient in the tub lying face down in the water. Before I move on, Think in your mind a three-year-old in a tub, different than an infant in a tub, which if any of you have had children or take care of children, babies that aren't used to sitting up or you know, can slip under the water easily, three-year-olds, hmm, interesting. How deep is that water, for one, and how difficult is it to slip under the water and drown, okay? EMS is on the scene, that's Emergency Medical Services 911, is on the scene. They documented that they found the patient in the living room, unresponsive on the floor, fully dressed, dry from head to toe, with a diaper on. A couple of things. Three-year-old with a diaper. Hmm. Not out of control, but unusual. Fully dressed after you just had a catastrophe where the kid is nearly drowned in a tub. All of these things could be real, but they're flags, right? So, the identified injuries on the scene were unresponsive with the corticate posturing, a Glasgow coma scale of five. Remembering from Aaron's lecture, any deviation in a Glasgow coma scale less than 15 makes you take notice. 14 definitely makes you take notice. 13 is very noticeable. Nine, we're intubating. Five is very devastating. Okay, this patient's jaw was clenched. The airway is partially obstructed by the tongue. Cap refill was greater than two seconds. Child had brachial pulses, but they were bounding and slow. Um, there's bruising and scarring and discoloration noted on the back. These were the vital signs. So we handed out little badge buddies. So if you ever look at them, the three-year-old, you can see these. When we go to do our recognizing pediatric extremis lecture, we're going to be talking about abnormalities and vital signs. Which one calls out to you right off the bat? Heart rate, very good. So heart rate of 58 in a three-year-old, not great. Respiratory rate still okay, blood pressure is still okay. So we have two major abnormalities here, Glasgow Coma Scale and heart rate. Um, it's best response to eye-opening, verbal, and motor. Well, they have ones in eye-opening and verbal. And motor is a three, which is not good. Okay. 
So this child is put in spinal immobilization. They're put on a PD backboard while manually holding C-spine. An oral pharyngeal airway is attempted without success. More than just the teeth clenching. You've got a big tongue, you've got the teeth down. And when a patient, if ever you've seen true teeth clenching, you really can't put anything in there. In fact, you have trouble putting a tongue blade in there. So we have that problem. So you're going to have trouble doing a jaw thrust and opening the airway. Sorry. So at this point, they're going to assist the ventilation. And pre-hospital, we're really teaching people to just use bag valve mask because they'll cause a delay and do harm trying to get that mouth open. So just ventilate. Okay. CPR is initiated due to the sinus bradycardia. Good. Um, and I always place in the left tibia. Normal saline is infused at a TKO rate. And they come in route to us code three. So the time at the scene was six minutes. Uh, transport time to the ED is four minutes. So we have 10 minutes where we are oxygenating this patient, but we're unsure of a very valuable piece of information, and that is how long the pre-time was. She said a few minutes in the tub. Even in absolute accidents, um, that time ticks away very quickly. So keep that in your mind. In any trauma resuscitation, we consider that upfront time. And so I want to talk about that. So they come to the emergency department. They're made a full trauma activation. Because in this institution, drowning is trauma. And for very good reason. We don't know whether they hit their head and drown and, or just simply drown. But any bathtub injury is trauma. Okay? So they come to us and arrive on the primary survey. The airway is obstructed by the tongue. They do a jaw thrust technique to open the airway while maintaining the C-spine. Sorry. The breathing is assisted bag valve mask, and the breath sounds are coarse, and the patient has labored breathing. Circulation, um, we already identified that they were doing chest compressions. Pink, cool, dry, the child still has central pulses with CPR, plus they had a heart rate. Um, disability, so we go ABC. Disability is the AV poop. Who wants to go to the head of the class? What does AV poop stand for? A is alert, alert verbal, painful, unresponsive. So this person is at the bottom of the AV poop. They're unresponsive. Their GCS is three now. Their pupils are five millimeters, and they're non-reactive bilaterally. Exposure, we have to expose the patient fully, but whenever you do that, you do warming measures. Uh, list some warming measures. What are those, at least in our department? Warm blankets are number one. Easy to get. What else? Lights, the overhead lights. Some of you are as old as me. You remember the French fry lights. We don't use those anymore. You know, I have nice overhead <laughs> kind. Um, what else? Warmed, so, warmed IV fluids if you're giving them. What else? Pardon me? We can use a port warm to put under the patient. Those big things that like you use when you're camping and like the little heel warmers, but they're really giant. Um, you can use those, especially if you put them under a child that warms them pretty easily. And we can change the ambient temperature of the room to make it like Tahiti in there. Why do you want to keep the patient warm? What's that? Okay, so a cold patient is a difficult to resuscitate patient because they do not hold their vital signs when they're cold. In trauma, a very serious thing with a cold patient is the increase in coagulopathies. So a cold patient will bleed and bleed and bleed. Okay? When we've taken patients to the OR, the room is very, very warm in there. Even though the ORs tend to be really cold, they keep the patient very warm. Okay. So what were the initial what are the initial priorities of care? in a trauma recess. Airway. Airway, which we had a difficulty with because the teeth were clenched, right? And B, what was the difficulty there? With shallow respirations, right? We had to bag it off mask. And C, what were the difficulties with C? Heart rate, um, increased cap refill. So these are the identified initial priorities. What are the initial intervention with these? Okay, so the, right. So the patient's being bag valve masked. You can't do that forever. Rapid sequence intubation. Right. Excellent. Rapid sequence intubation. Um, when you bag valve, it's perfect for pre-hospital, but when they get to definitive care, we need to control the airway. Okay. 
so head of the class with Silvana. Um, RSI, we secured definitive airway, intubated the patient. Um, simultaneous PIV established, the IO was no longer patent. Um, RSI meds were given, trauma labs were drawn. These are the trauma labs, so CBC, type and cross, LFTs, they do a bedside EPOC, or ISTAT is what we used to call them, and COAGs. So this all happens initially, and we have to pay attention to the detailed history and document. Okay. These are the vital signs now. What's different here? Blood pressure. That's a wackadoodle blood pressure. It's probably not correct, but that's okay. You know, that's a very unusual one. In head trauma, what would we expect to see with a blood pressure? Hypertension, hypotension, something. This is kind of like a, I don't know what. This is a, a cuff, is it right? But that's fine. Um, heart rate is 65, they're being bagged, and O2 sats are 100%. So, what's the vital sign up top here in the repeat that seems worrisome? 34. Right, 34 too. This kid's cold, we need to continue to warm them. He said that, heart rate's still 65. Blood pressure is still wacky, now I'm worried, because we're getting repeat ones like this. Narrow pulse pressure. Um, the patient is intubated and being ventilated. We're doing a good job. Now we've moved on because we have A, B, C, D, E, right? Now we're moved on to the secondary survey. The head has bruising and a laceration behind the left ear and left earlobe. The neck has a hard C collar on. Chest has multiple scars and abrasions in differing colors. Um, who can tell me about the colors of bruising? What's the first color of bruising? like an immediate, a new bruise is what color? Red, and, Red. right? Red. The next color is going to be purple. What's the next color? Yellow. Yellow, green. And then it fades, right? So usually in non-accidental trauma, there's kind of this rainbow thing. If they're covered in bright red, kind of, it's, I'm sorry to say it this way, it's a more new beating. And then in various degrees, okay? Um, like my grandkids have all sorts of like, bathtub shin bruising, you know, like this where I can see those all the time, but they're in varying degrees. They're yellow from toddlers hit their shins a lot. It goes along with absolute mechanism of injury, but we'll talk into more. Um, so abdomen is firm with an abrasion. Pelvis has abrasions. Upper extremities have abrasions to the left arm. Lower extremities have scars, bruising, abrasions, and a hematoma to the right thigh. The back look similar to the other findings. Okay, what are the initial priorities of care now? We've dealt with ABC. We're going to prepare to go to the OR. And diagnostics or definitive care should be delayed. So we're not going to be doing this fancy dancy workup. The highest priority when you suspect a head injury is going to the OR. What red flags have you identified in this patient presentation? <laughs> well, like Here's okay. I have an entire yeah, United Nations of flags. Child abuse. But child abuse, the last treatment, the bruising behind the ear, abnormal vital signs, abnormal uh, Glasgow coma scale, the story that doesn't fit the level of injuries. What else? <coughs> Not age appropriate that a three year old would drown in a bathtub <coughs> necessarily. Um, so that's that on that. Okay, so child maltreatment is defined by the CDC as any act or series of act of commission or omission by a parent or other caregiver that results in harm, potential harm, or threat to a child. So, not even if you just don't seek care, it's the same. Okay? So, acts of commission are deliberate and intentional although the resulting harm may not be the intended consequence. All right, also commonly known as non-accidental trauma, NAD. Years ago, and people have been here as long as I have, um, people are familiar with shaken baby syndrome, abusive head trauma, Kempis. Years ago, Kempis, you know, we used to actually dot, diagnose it as Kempis. Yeah. They don't use that anymore. Uh, it's been a long time. And in fact, when I discuss it, do you remember that? We used to say Kempis a lot. And we used to no one does that anymore. Just like we don't say Mongolian spots anymore. Because the people in Mongolia got offended. So <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. Um, 
What is the sentinel sign of shaken baby? Retinal hemorrhages, right? Is there an age cutoff for retinal hemorrhages? Okay. Interestingly, we had a very recent trauma with a pretty big kid that actually had retinal hemorrhages. You can, it's easier to get them in a young baby because it's easier to shake them and have the same effect. But violent shaking in even a three or five year old can actually cause retinal hemorrhages. Yeah. If you have that finding in an older child, that's more than a flag. Okay, so the CDC facts at a glance. In 2010, approximately 700,000 children, so this is about nine kids or nine and a half kids, I don't know if separate it, per thousand, were victims of maltreatment. So CPS reports of child maltreatment are underestimated. Um, Non-CPS studies report rates between 15 and 43 per 1,000 U.S. children experience some form of child maltreatment. It can be as basic as neglect, or not feeding kids well, all the way to devastating trauma. 34% uh, of victims younger than four years of age are the highest rate um, for the, the highest rate of trauma for those less than one year of age. In 2010, an estimated 1,500 kids um, were victims of maltreatment and died. This is a rate of 2.1 per 100,000 children. So, of the, all of these things I'm saying, 79% of NAT fatalities were in children less than four years of age. Um, without being blunt, it's easier to hurt them, right? Most victims were maltreated by a parent. That's about 81%. Okay, so red flags of NAT. Just call them out. Right? Changing or inconsistent stories, right? At triage, we'll have, somebody will come in with a small child and the chief complaint is cough. Okay, that's very, very common. Or chief complaint is they were otherwise fine and they now have, or woke up sick, or I couldn't wake them up. So that's history. Delay in seeking care. Um, very common we hear they went down for a nap or went to sleep, and in the morning they were like this, unresponsive. Um, the parent or caregiver affect is hostile or indifferent. Abusive head trauma is indicated by cerebral edema or intracranial bleeds or retinal hemorrhage like we spoke about. Fractures are usually isolated bone fractures, river sternal fractures, um, complex skull fractures. Humerus fractures in less than three-year-old are 95% non-accidental trauma. And femur fractures in kids less than one-year-old are 60 to 70%. Non-ambulatory kids don't break their bones mm -hmm. easily it's nearly impossible. So when a little baby, like an eight-month-old or a six-month-old, has a femur fracture, giant red flag, right? It's not impossible. So, you know, you have to absolutely keep your biases, and we'll talk about that. You know, big brother can fall on little child and break the femur. That isn't the same thing as child maltreatment. Okay. Bruising, especially in non-ambulatory patients, Again, they're not walking around. It isn't like a toddler, like I was talking about, who runs into things and falls on their toys and that kind of stuff. Babies shouldn't have bruises. Why would they, right? Um, and it's near the ears or it's patterned. So listen to your inner voice. Suspicion is sometimes a good thing. It doesn't mean you have to be accusatory, but it means you have to have suspicion, okay? So. So here's an, a picture is worth a thousand words. So this is a swollen ear, unlikely it's got a little lack on it. The middle picture, what's that a picture of? Other than that finger that has red nail polish, which looks a little distracting. Um, the penis bruised, right? And the baby on your right, what is that? It's bruised. What causes that kind of bruise? General. Yeah. 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 Just exactly. Or years ago, they used to do, they used to say boxing kids' ears, you know, and they used to slam them. Those kids usually, usually used to present without necessarily bruising, but would present with broken tympanic membranes. Okay? So that's the other thing. Without an infection and bilateral um, broken eardrums, 
It shouldn't be like that. It's not impossible, but it's a high level of suspicion. Okay, so those were sentinel type injuries. And minor ones are for pre-mobile child that are poorly or unexplained. Um, a baby with ear hematomas like we talked about. A fracture with no clear explanation. Um, these may be the only clues of abuse. If recognized, it may provide a small window of opportunity to prevent escalating violence and save the baby's life. All of you, I'm sure, have read where um, CPS had a visit to their home previously, or the school reported something, and someone went out there and made sure everything was okay, and then they've come back. You don't want to be the one that's missed that opportunity. It nearly breaks our heart when they've come to the ED with illness. We give them something for illness, and they come back with trauma, major trauma, because it makes us look back to see what we may have missed. Okay? In chart reviews for cases with abuse of head trauma, often the child, like I said, was seen in the past by a pediatrician. Usually they're minor at this point, or the pediatrician has a sense of concern. But this is where we have communication breakdown sometimes. You know, the pediatrician's office may be highly worried and highly alerted, but the emergency department isn't, okay? No abuse workup was done at the time, and that's done really what happened. So, in non-accidental trauma, trauma, the general management considerations are, so they come in, we've identified them that they're at risk, we do a skeletal survey, head CT, if they have dilated pupils, that's a neurologic thing. Um, we, we ask for an opto consult to look for retinal hemorrhages, uh, lab studies to screen for abdominal injuries, these labs that we talked about already. Um, we, we screen for occult drug injury, we actually had a significant trauma recently that the story ahead of time was that the small child, three-year-old, had gotten into drugs at the home and had ingested them. So the pre-hospital report was, we think they got into something, we found them unresponsive, we think it's urine tox. I mean, we think body tox. So we went down the very serious path, med stat, urine tox, we handled ABC, looked head to toe and there's no obvious signs of bruising or trauma so you continue to go down um, with an ophthalmology consult they had some retinal hemorrhages which was interesting okay and we screen also for drug if it was drug then we would have stopped that problem you look for neglect and risk in that way but it wasn't child maltreatment from trauma um, we screen for predisposing conditions. What are some predisposing conditions that the child may show up with trauma? Osteogenesis imperfecta, what else? Say they're covered in bruises. Coagulopathies. Coagulopathies, right. So there's all of those as well. Definitely ED social work consult and reporting to child protective services. Now Dr. Crawford and his team want to be notified in real time. So you have a suspicion, they want to know. So we page them, we leave messages, and we send an email. Okay? That isn't like, gosh, I was really worried about this, and you go home. Okay? You stop. Okay, so sentinel injuries. If there's no additional injury detected on skeletal survey or head CT in an infant with a history um, or an exam of a sentinel injury, Abuse remains the primary diagnostic consideration because of the sentinel injury may be the first and only injury from abuse. The next one, the child may come in and extremis. Therefore, a history of um, sentinel event should be prompt and a report to the authorities. Um, there's some references at the back that you'll be able to see. This has been studied and studied and studied. And for children that had a report on the first sign of injury, the abuse was able to be stopped right then, and the child actually could be rescued. Okay, so decision to report to CBS, CPS may be difficult, but remember, any parent or care caregiver may momentarily lose control. This actually might mean the whole family needs help. We don't know what's going on, right? And it could have been an impulsive time. We have to rescue both the child who's being maltreated and perhaps the caregiver that's overwhelmed. They might need respite. Who knows what they have at home else going on, right? Um, we'll talk about more risk factors as we go. People other than parents may have abused the child. In the case that I was talking about, 
a caregiver was watching, and the caregiver actually had a history of abuse with children, but the parents who put the child in that person's care had no idea. So, um, safety of the infant is paramount. We're mandated to report suspicion. And this is an important um, distinction. We don't need to have diagnostic certainty. So you don't need a head CT with a giant bleed. You don't need bruises from head to toe. If you're suspicious, you need to report. Okay? Missing abuse could lead to escalation of the abuse or even death. Um, reporting may be the only opportunity to prevent further abuse. You don't want to go home and have regrets. You definitely don't want to come in the next day and go, oh, I knew it, I knew it, right? It won't be your fault, but it's your opportunity. This is a young child with pattern bruising from repeated whippings with leather belt. This seems somewhat obvious, like you've got to wonder who could miss that. Let me tell you how you could miss this. How many times we have patients in a room and the chief complaint, like I said, at triage is ear pain or a cough. They go in a room, the policy is to unrest the child, right? And see everything? No, no. That child's sitting there fully clothed. Come and check the ears. The ears look fine. Here's your prescription. Thanks for calling. Boom. Right? And this is what's underneath the clothing. So, this is a cautionary tale. Fully expose the patient. Alright? This happened to me one time with a, not related to maltreatment, but the patient was a gunshot victim. The patient looked perfect. Wasn't complaining of anything. Went home, took a shower, and he actually had a gunshot wound to his leg. No one actually undressed him fully and saw the GSW to the leg. Okay. So risk factors, they're child specific. Infants and young children younger than four years of age are a risk factor. Disability, mental and physical, including prematurity. So premature babies are at high risk for child maltreatment. Why is this, do we think? Pardon me? They cry a lot, they're high intensity. The perfect world that you thought, you're gonna carry a baby for 40 weeks, you've had the baby, you go home, you think it's gonna be perfect in the nursery. Instead, you've just had a stressful one month admission to the PICU or whatever. Um, your child is more challenging, they may have health needs, they may have disabilities. It causes stress both financially and emotionally on families. Um, and the kids, have diff and certain kids with difficult temperaments, like colicky babies, or ones that refuse to sleep, or, or are difficult nursers, all that stuff puts them at risk for maltreatment. Um, Caregiver-specific risk factors, um, increased risk of perpetration. Unrealistic parental expectations, lacking the understanding of a child's developmental needs. This happens a lot surrounding potty training. We hear them like, you know, I just can't get them potty trained and the kid's 15 months old. Because of the old, I know it sounds funny, like, haha, get over yourself. Years, years ago, grandparents used to train those kids, all who really got trained were the parents, but you know that was the expectation, why aren't they doing that? We hear a lot of growth and development expectations, why aren't they feeding themselves, why aren't they eating, why don't they sleep through the night? Okay, so sometimes we have to reset those expectations. Um, domestic or intimate partner violence in the home, the kids can be in the middle of it or be used as a pawn in the argument. We've seen that where, if you've read news, you know, where the child's in the middle of um, two adults fighting and the child's the one that gets the abuse. Um, substance abuse, mental health issues in the home. Um, this is where people are not even in their right mind and they hurt their child. Sometimes when they come out of it, they don't even realize they've done it. And what happens also is they come to triage was like, I don't know where this came from and they actually did it when they were impaired, okay? Um, parental history of child maltreatment, this puts high risk. If you were treated this way, it's the cycle of abuse that goes on for generations. It's our job to try to intervene and stop the violence. Um, this is an interesting one. Parenting beliefs that support or justify maltreatment behaviors. If you've worked in the ED for a long time and looked into the lobby, We've seen a fair amount where they discipline their children, like right in front of you. Um, we've had where like a parent takes off the belt and is getting ready to whack the kid right in the triage area in front of everyone. But the point is they don't see it as abuse. They see it as discipline. We're like horrified and try to intervene and all that. But in their mind, this is their belief. The child did something wrong and this is how you discipline. So re-educate. Yes. 
what is, is that an emergency department nurse's role to intervene in that or get social work involved? I mean, how, like, all I mean, of the it's, above. It's really a touchy situation to be telling parents what to do and what not to do in that sort of situation. So how do you? It's a really good question. It's a team effort, without sounding too colloquial that way. It is a team effort. You have to stop it. You're not going to sit there and allow them, oh, that's just how they discipline. You're not going to allow them to beat the kid. We've gone in and said, OK, you need to stop. We're going to need you to stop. And we're going to have to talk about this once you're in the room. And usually, if you call them on it, they'll stop at that point. We have law enforcement and security. It just shows, actually, where their boundaries are. If they feel comfortable doing that in an open space, in public, in front of health care, you can imagine what possibly could go on, go on at home. So we absolutely protect the patient and advocate immediately, whatever it would take at that point. And we call social service, and we provide them resources and education about levels of discipline. Um, corporal punishment is out. I know that sounds dorky. In the way older years, my parents' years, corporal punishment wasn't out. And corporal punishment is spanking, hitting, right, putting in a closet, whatever. That's what corporal punishment was. It was really common. Believe it or not, it's written in the regs of schools now that you're not allowed to do corporal punishment, meaning it used to be allowed. Many of you guys are youngsters, but in my years in school, swats with the wood thing with the holes in it. And if you misbehave, you bend over and you got swats. Well, who can imagine that now? If someone tried to swat my kid, I'd swat them. <laughs> that wouldn't happen. But it was very common then, right? OK. So, and the transient caregivers in the home. Lots of caregivers, who did what, no one's owning it or taking responsibility. Um, there's two things that should worry you with kids. One is if they're overly fearful, like really fearful. So you're approaching the kid and you go to reach for your stethoscope and the kid goes like that. That's worrisome, right? You know what else is actually more worrisome? When I walk up to a toddler and they jump in my arms. Yeah. I'm like, what? I'm a total stranger, and you've jumped in my arms. So does that mean get me out of here, or what does that mean? So there's a fine line, and it all might be within realms of normal. You know, fearful's good, friendly's good, overly is not good, right? Especially, like I said, if you reach for something and they do a defensive mode, okay? All right. So family-specific risk factors, um, whether there's dysfunctional parents and families, you know, there might be things going on. Um, there might be educational difficulties. Um, domestic or in intimate partner violence in the home, we talked about this. Increased household stressors like poverty, um, work issues, lack of resources, if they don't have child care. There's a number of things. These are things that actually just make you take notice. And they should be included and documented in um, the medical record. And social work does a really great job of writing these things up. Um, community and societal risk factors are isolation and lack of community support. Some moms and dads have um, very little childcare, a lot of children, not enough money, they have to go to work, all the things that go on. Um, they may have no relatives or friends. They may have just relocated here and community violence. OK, so now we're back in the ED, ED trauma resuscitation. The diagnostics we did were lateral C-spine. Um, this was, and the portable was in normal limits. Chest x-ray, no red back fractures. CT showed um, an extra axial hemorrhage, cerebral edema. The abdomen had a liver lack. Pelvis has no internal injuries. Uh-oh. So, this is what the CT show. What do we see here? Right, so they're all hematoma, right? Okay, so what injuries do we know so far on this patient? Liver lack, head bleed, bruising, retinal hemorrhages, um, Glasgow Cone Scale issue, which, so they have neurologic deficit. We have circulatory deficit. The kids had CPR twice already. So traumatic brain injury. These are bruises in varying stages of healing. What are we preparing for? What are we going to do? 
Transport to the OR for an emergent craniotomy. On consult with social service, CPS, a forensic pediatrician, this is CCP, Dr. Crawford and his team. Um, hematology, ophthalmology.